So I went back there and I did that, and, uh, and it was fun. And then something hit me that was kind of cool. Because I have three kids, and I now have five grandkids. And what happened was I was getting three of my grandkids in Sunday school, which was kind of cool because I got to bypass my kids to get directly to my grandkids. And then it became something I, I really enjoyed doing, so that was fun. So uh, in any event, uh, you know, I asked Russ, I said, well, you know, do you want me to pick up where you were? Because, you know, he's teaching in a series. And uh, he said, no. And, you know, Jason has been doing a fabulous job teaching on Sunday school. Those of you who have not made it, uh, you would enjoy it because it's such a good study time. And uh, so then you get the idea of you're a substitute teacher, and you say, okay, well, do you have a lesson sheet with a chapter? And I'll just kind of ask the questions, and everybody can do their thing. And that didn't work. So uh, in any event, I'm here. I'm glad to be here. We're happy to have you here. I don't think we have anybody that's a visitor. I think uh, most everybody has been here uh, in the past. And uh, if we have any visitors, uh, I don't know. Todd, do we have a visitor in the back? You see, Mark, I've never met you, so, you know, I could do that. I just really wanted to embarrass somebody in front of everyone. But uh, this, is, this is good, and this is fun, and I'm excited to be here. So uh, what we're going to do, I don't think, does anybody have anything to share, any announcements? Uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's kind of fun. You know, Suncoast Bible Fellowship, I met Russ because uh, he came to me. He was looking for a Christian CPA to help get the tax-exempt status of the organization, and we had a meeting set for an hour, and we spent four hours together, and it was the beginning of a relationship that's probably gone 20, 25 years now. And, uh, you know, when you, say, when you talk about church, you know, I'm going to church. Um, I've had opportunity over the last week to talk to several people. Actually, I got my motorcycle back. It, uh, I needed to get two new tires on it and brakes, and I picked it up, and on my way home it was raining, and I did something I've never done before. I pulled over underneath an overpass. Never done that. You ever see these guys? They're under the overpass. I pulled over an underpass, and you know, under the under the uh, under underpass, under the overpass, they have the the stones that are built on an angle, and you can kind of like climb up and sit on them. So I I get off my bike, and there's a kid sitting, and his bicycle is sitting there, and I went up and I sat down with him, and I talked with him for 40 minutes and shared the gospel with him, and it was fun, uh, and yet at the same time, when you have the opportunity to share the gospel with someone you recognize how un, I don't want to say uneducated, how uninformed the world is and how confused they are uh, about um, spiritual matters. I'm talking to this young guy and I said to him, do you believe in God? You know, it's actually kind of a theme of what we're talking about today. And he goes, well, he says, you know, I mean, something had to make this happen. That's pretty common. Uh, to have that general idea that it didn't happen by accident. Uh, and he said, I, I, I kind of consider myself to be a spiritual person. What is that? You know, I mean, where do you get the idea that something is spiritual? And uh, so it was interesting, and, and we got to talk, and since, you know, I guess it's been a long time since I've learned how not to talk about religion. Um, you know, when you first... When you first come to understand that the Bible has some truth in it and Jesus Christ uh, died on a cross, rose from the dead, and there's a lot of talk and there's a lot of churches and you get excited, you actually get religious. And, and you, don't, you don't even do it by intent. You do it because you joined something new that you didn't know and didn't understand, and you look around and you do what they do. You know, when we first uh, came to an understanding, I, mean, I was raised Catholic and quit at about 16, and when we first came to an understanding uh, of, of some Bible truth, um, I had to go to the Catholic Church because I didn't want to go to hell. And so we went. And, you know, after a few months, we, we, uh, we, we went someplace else because my wife asked me questions that I, I had no clue of how to answer because I never opened a Bible in my life. And some of you who have that Catholic background, you know about it. Um, I was talking to somebody this week. Uh, a good friend of mine told me that he found in his old files his catechism from when he's young. And, and he knows our group. Uh, they're, they're associated with us. His son comes here. And he says, well, I'm not going to give it to you because I know if I give it to you, you're going to bash the Catholics. And uh, it, we just get religious. We, we join. I went to Central Christian Church for nine years, and I started to do what they do, and I started to believe what they believe. When I joined the Rotary Club, I started to recite the four-way test every time I went to lunch because you know what they do? They get up and they all say this thing. It's this, this, this thing they say. And you become one of them. And the reason I bring that up is because Suncoast Bible Fellowship 
is actually a tax-exempt organization with a federal ID number registered with the state of Florida and the Internal Revenue. You can't be a member of that. People talk about being members of their church. You know, are you a member? Uh, my son was uh, going to uh, Starkey Road uh, Youth Group. He's 28 now, so he was probably 13 or so. And I went and picked him up there one day, and I got out of the car, and uh, there were other people there picking up their kids, and a guy comes up to me, and he says, Hey, how you doing? You know how people are at church. They're the happy, happy people. And he goes, Hey, how you doing? And he puts his hand out, and he says, Are you a member? And I said, Of the body of Christ, yeah. <laughs> you know, Because the understanding you have has to be in accordance with something that is truth. And, it, it, and you got to find what truth is. Not membership, not affiliation, not association. And I think when Russ came up with the name of Suncoast Bible Fellowship, the principle behind the idea was fellowship. Uh, he liked to say, two fellows on the same ship go in the same way. And so the idea was a fellowship, a gathering of people together to learn really to learn, to get inside. So I, so I wrote something, I thought about it. I heard a guy say this at a conference, and he said, um, believing in God, is that the same as believing God? Well, think about that. I was talking to Jason. I said, you know, I don't think that there's a man, woman on the planet that doesn't believe in God. However they frame it up, or however they do what they do, I believe everyone believes in God whatever they call it. I mean, I don't think an atheist, how, how, what is an atheist? Someone who doesn't believe in something that doesn't exist? I mean, that makes no sense. If it doesn't exist, why do you have an organization to not believe in it? I mean, you see, just frame up your thinking to say what you want to say, to be what you want to be. It's an affiliation. It's an association. It's, it's, it's money and power. It's political influence. Um, you know, uh, the federal government has uh, endorsed uh, same-sex marriage. So now marriage is gone. I mean, it, it really is. It's gone. I mean, it's been reduced to a legal contract, and what's going to happen now is the federal government and the tax laws are all going to have to change to accommodate the new definition. Uh, there's, uh, there's professional practices. I'm a CPA. There's professional practices out there that are identified as LGBT practices. I mean, these are all sinners like us that need a Savior, and what happens is the people who get to be in charge, use their weaknesses to form something to push it their way. So um, let's open with a word of prayer, and we're going to talk about God's word and believing in God versus believing God, because I think that's pretty significant. So let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are grateful to be here. We're grateful to have a place that we can gather to meet uh, with a single-minded purpose of simply trying to understand what it is you've revealed to us through something called the Bible through uh, printed pages that have words on them uh, for us to have so that we can know you. It's, it's just so big. And we ask that you would help us, uh, as you can and as you do, to uh, grow in our understanding of what it is you would have us to know as to who it is that we are in our relationship with you. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Uh, open your Bible to Romans. Uh, Romans chapter 1. Jason made reference to this verse this morning, and I held it up, and I said, you're stealing my message. And uh, it was a great meeting this morning, and really, I'm, I'm serious. If there's a way you can make it, you know, you can't have too much Bible preaching, because when, when the preaching gets going, and you're comparing verses to verses, and you're learning, you kind of start doing this wow thing, you know? Uh, I, I was talking to him this morning. I, I read an article that somebody said, and he said, why Paul? Now, think about this for a minute. It's just frame your thinking. Why Paul? And, and what, what people, when somebody asks that question, they're saying, let's use some human wisdom, human logic, human reasoning to grasp why God chose Paul. Now, the reality is it's not about why Paul. When you read and you understand what God did with Paul, it's more, wow, Paul. It, it's not the reasoning that I can comprehend why God did it. It's the magnificent genius of God and how he's doing what he's doing. When you see what he did to take Saul of Tarsus, the enemy of the believing remnant of the, of, of the nation of Israel, and to use him to introduce information that previously hadn't been uh, revealed, you just go, wow, I can't believe you used Paul. Got me with that one. Didn't see that one coming. 
You know what I mean? Rather than trying to say, does that make sense to me? Because when you talk to people, I talked to this young man sitting uh, underneath the uh, overpass. I talked to him, and he's going, ah, I never thought about it that way. I, I, I took a client to, to meet a financial planner, and he starts going down a path of all this talking, and he's telling me about Rush Limbaugh, and he's telling me about he's a conservative, and he's telling me what clubs he belongs to, right? You know, he, he's giving me the affiliations, and I said to him, I said, you know, I said, if I say anything to you today, and that'll happen here. That happens when you hear somebody preaching. If I say anything to you today that makes you think different, the conversation you have that pertains to whatever we discuss is now going to be seasoned with new information. So the opinion you had coming in gets influenced and becomes a little different as you go out. We are the product of who we associate with. We are the product of the opinions of others. I mean, we turn on the news and we have an opinion. Oh, we could have fun discussing George Zimmerman today, couldn't we? I mean, you know, who's got ideas about what? You know what? You don't know what you don't know. And you can't know what you don't know. And what you don't know, it's a whole lot bigger than what you do know. So to have an opinion about it and take a position and a stand is kind of arrogant, you know? So what I want to get to is man believes in God. Romans chapter 1, and we're going to start in verse 18. And uh, Apostle Paul writing, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Man does not have a justifiable explanation of, well, I didn't know. You know there's a God. I mean, think about evolution. I've had a guy who was an evolutionary guy uh, say, well, you know, you guys and your concept of God, where'd God come from? I can't grasp something that has always existed, had no beginning. Well, he's not thinking, is he? If you're an evolutionary guy and there's no creator, whatever that primordial ooze is that, that had the Big Bang had to have always existed, well, you got to put a creator on the front end. You see what I mean? Oh, well, they don't say that in our meetings. So, I mean, you have to believe in eternal forever existence without a creator. So you either have the creator who eternally existed or whatever it is that always existed, but where'd it come from? You have to have a creator. Man is without excuse, no matter what he claims. Well, we don't believe in God. The truth is we don't believe in your God because your God is really a product of your opinions, your associations, your affiliations, and bottom line, your religion. The reason you know that man, everyone, believes in God is because he's religious. Look at how many people are out there today that are gathering together in some formal idea of worship, practice, ritual, tradition, procedure. Man is scared of dying. See, I, I, I read this and I thought this was neat. Every man believes two things. Number one, he believes there is a God. Uh, Psalm 14.1, I mean, you don't need to go there. The verse says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Man believes, number one, there is a God. And number two, innately, they know they're going to face him in judgment. They know that. Go to Hebrews 2.15. We're going to just kind of run some verses. But this is just kind of an interesting verse because it basically gives you the result of the fear and the thinking. I mean, the verse says, Hebrews 2.15, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. You know, I, I've shared, a, I've had some instances with some deaths recently. In fact, uh, um, that very close friend of mine who took his own life, uh, his granddaughter's having a baptismal ceremony today. I don't know if it's a baptism, a christening. You know, I, I was going to go uh, because of their invite. Um, but, but I watch them because they don't know what happens when you die. 
You know, they don't know, what does that mean? I mean, if you just cease, that's good. But, you know, dearly de beloved, the, the departed. I mean, departing is leaving. I mean, there's so much in Scripture that talks about after you're dying. I mean, we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Well, how are you going to appear? You know, we got lawyers in the room. I get a notice to appear. That means i got to show up. Well, how am I going to show up if I'm not in a body anymore? But people who don't understand death and they don't understand what you can learn in this book are petrified of it coming. Because you know what they know? They're going to die. Everybody dies. You know, I was talking to um, my son's girlfriend, and, and, and uh, my son was saying something about how he was feeling, and she says, well, you know, you're, you're not going to die of that. And I said, well, he's going to die of something. <laughs> and they don't like it when I matter-of-factly talk about it. You know, we gather here because we say we believe something, and this is really it. Believing in God and believing God. Two different things. I mean, go to James uh, 2. I think it's James 2, verse 19. This is a kind of a good verse for that. Um, believing in God. What good is that? And this is a verse that's probably used... Uh, Wait for you to get there. James 2.19 says, um, Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Most everyone, if not everyone, believes in God. But that's not the issue. Because there's a revelation that comes to us here, and that's a good question when we get to the word or the words, which is, which is important. Because if you have something you believe, why do you believe it? And what's the authority that it is? So a man, a man knows he's going to face something and he's afraid of it. So what man does then, and the evidence of that, is his religious behavior. It, it, it's a fervor to do. It's a performance. It's, it's a being good. It, it's not a swing toward light and truth, but it's rather seeking to get in touch with their spiritual side. That's what this young man said to me. The family that experienced this death, when I talked to the daughter, um, I asked her, do you believe in God? Well, you know, I don't believe in God, but I'm, I consider myself to be a spiritual person. I said, what does that mean? And then she said, I believe in heaven. I said, where'd you get that? Where'd you get heaven from? I mean, is that a book? Was it a TV show? Is it a location? You know, why would you say you believe in heaven? Because people do that. They randomly select what's going to fit their own theology, and they become religious about it whether it's going out and looking at the trees and reciting some meditation, uh, whether it's uh, uh, ritually praying. Uh, we've talked about prayer in here before. My grandkids playing basketball over at uh, Pasadena Community. And they, it was, you know, we said, okay, Christian environment's good, a little basketball league, a bunch of eight-year-olds. And they all gather together on the floor, and the guy who's leading it says, uh, uh, does anybody want to pray? And, you know... I was thinking, and I said, I just kind of watched. And he says, okay, I will. So he closes his eyes, he bows his head, and he says, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now, my grandkids are learning the Bible. They're learning to talk to God. And they were like, what was that? You know, what was that all about? We're playing basketball here. You know, I mean, why are we talking about that? Uh, but it's rituals, it's religion, it's tradition, and man will fight for it. He'll cling to it, he'll have wars over it. And that's what happens. But it's evidence that man believes in God because he's afraid of him. He's afraid of dying. He's afraid of what that means. And our job is one that should be of educating them. So, you know, the, the sad part is how much of the world that believes in God but doesn't believe God. How do you believe God? Don't you got to have something from God in order to believe God? I mean, think about it. You would know nothing about God unless God chose to reveal it to you. And he doesn't reveal it to you through your experiences. He doesn't reveal it to you through the growth in your business. He doesn't reveal it to you through the stop sign uh, or the red light that hesitated when the car ran through it or you didn't step on the gas. Uh, there's no guardian angels hanging onto your bumpers yelling, get your foot off, I can't hold it any longer. You know, I mean, everybody that believes in God doesn't know God doesn't know how to believe God, so what do they do? They make up God. You know, when I first came to an understanding of who Jesus Christ was in the Bible, I turned on the TV and said, if that's God, I want it. Because I wanted it. I wanted to know. So that's good. 
You want to be hungry. You want to be eager. You want to find out what you can find out. But I was getting Kenneth Copeland and Jimmy Swaggart and, you know, little tidbits of good stuff going along in there and then a lot of religion and tradition and a lot of money. So that's sad. So how do you believe God? People do look for God everywhere except where he is. They look for him in their circumstances, like I just said, physical and financial. Um, you know, uh, the, you guys understand what Calvinism is, the, the Calvinistic theology of, uh, you know, predestination, the five points. I mean, God basically preordained and pre-structured everything, and really you're just a puppet that's kind of walking through trying to figure out where God's steering you. I mean, how many people do you know that are just praying over something? We believe God is leading us to do this. I've said it. You know, in my experience, uh, we almost sold our house and moved um, early on in our marriage. Uh, um, an accounting firm in Rome, Georgia, offered me a position. I had a contract on six acres of land. I was going to build a historical replica Victorian home, and we were all excited about it, but we were scared, and I got a phone call, had a plane ticket in hand, and got a phone call from Joe Lake, the guy in the firm. He says, Frank, we want to hold back the offer till December, which is only three months. He says, you can still come on up but we, don't, we can't do it until December. We just bought a practice. And we said, you know what? We're not coming. And we had just been sitting at the table and saying, God, if we shouldn't go, you got to tell us. Because <laughs> we were scared. You know what it was? We were scared. We really didn't want to go. We were going to leave my parents. We were going to leave all my friends. We were going to leave everything that we knew. And so when we saw it, we said, aha, we'll take that. That was God's notification. Don't go. Looking at the signs and the circumstances, do you realize if you chase the signs and the circumstances in life, you will never be grounded in who you are in Christ because you'll be waiting for the next flag to show up to give you some new thought to go somewhere. We need to quit making up God. If you want to believe God, you've got to find out where God is and what God has done. You know, the truth is, like that circumstance with me, because I wrote this down here, I said, people look for God everywhere except where he is, for instance, wherever they want him to be. I wanted him to be in that conversation because I didn't want to go, so I used him as the reason it happened or didn't happen. You know what I mean? So they're looking in the wrong place. That's the problem. But the solution is to stop promoting religion, but instead examine, now think about this, the revelation that God himself has given of himself. Examine the revelation God himself has given of himself himself, of his will, of his purpose. 2 Timothy 3.16. I mean, you know the verse, but let's go there because I want to look at something on it. In 2 Timothy 3.16, popular verse, uh, memory verse. Um, but look at this. This depends on how you want to look at it. Now, we have a book. There's a lot of books out there, a lot of them. Um, I've got people I've studied with who have NIVs, New American Standards, various different kinds of Bibles, and, they, and, and, and what happens is uh, they're all conflicting authorities. I mean, Christianity today does not believe they have a perfect, infallible, inerrant book. Now, if you have one, you have to know how you know you have one. And I'm, I'm really saying that to challenge you. Okay, when I said I joined the Rotary Club and we got up and we say these four things, well, if you're going to hang out with the people at Suncoast Bible Fellowship, you'll hear us say we believe the King James Bible is the authoritative word of God for English-speaking people, infallible, inerrant, without flaw, perfect in every way. And you know what? You'll say, and you'll talk to somebody, you'll say, well, how can you say that? How do you know? And, and if you really want to back it up, whenever I ask that question, I've, I've had several guys that I've done this to, pastors included, uh, and professionals I work with. Uh, again, when a guy's off sitting in the waiting room and he's got a Bible, and he's telling me he's a believer. Because, you know, people are proud of their religion. You know, I mean, I mean I'm mean, i thankful to be in the church, the body of Christ, and be saved, because I know I don't deserve to be there. And if you follow me around, I'll prove to you why I don't belong. But I have a Savior who did something for me on my behalf, and I'm trusting what he did, and I'm resting in that. I'm resting in it. Now, if I'm resting in that, I'm resting in something I read. I'm re resting in something that's got ink utilized to place it on a piece of paper that was shaved off a tree somewhere. I'm trusting in something I'm reading. 
And so if you're going to, well, so what I was going to say was, I, I said to the guy, and I said, do you believe that that book is perfect, infallible, and inerrant? Right there. Uh, 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 I don't know how to answer that. I mean, how could I say that? And what do you do with people who are gathered together in their Christian ceremonial experience when the guy in the front says, well, mine says this and yours might say that. Here's what it means. Wow, you've just transferred the authority to truth to the guy in the pulpit. And you'll even do it because you'll take a, wor a, a verse that says the Spirit of God dwells in him. And he's been ordained, so that does something. I don't know what that does. It gets something on him, and it makes him better. You know, it's like it tunes his antennas to better communication so that he's the guy who's receiving the messages so that he can communicate to me who's stupid and ignorant and can't read what it really means. And the only reason he gets away with it is because he doesn't know, and there's multiple conflicting authorities out there, which is Satan's effective plan of robbing you of an authority. Because if you don't have one, folks, you've got nothing to preach. You really don't. You say you believe this book, okay? If a guy was swallowed by a big fish and spit up on a beach, that's truth. If there was a flood that wiped out the planet, that's truth. You can't say, I want to believe that piece, but I'm not going to believe that piece. I mean, the Catholic Church is now saying, well, those are all stories. Judaism, ultra-Orthodox is what they call it now, that actually believes there's still a Messiah. Most of it, it says, well, you know, like Jason was teaching this morning about figures, about illustrations. He said, well, those are just really concepts to help us understand the importance and significance of who we are as, uh, as Jews. There's really not going to be a Messiah. You know, that was, that was those guys back then, and that's really not what's happening today. Most of Christianity does not believe the book is perfect. If it's not, you've got nothing. You got nothing. I mean, we're gathering together to feel good. This is just a motivational se a seminar. You know, we're just going to try and say something to encourage you, make you feel better, and go out. And when I was teaching Right Division over at Central Christian Church, the minister of adults invited me out to breakfast because I had guys that were growing and understanding. I had a guy come up to me in class one day. We were doing the book of Galatians. He says, Frank, you know, if this is true, he's holding his Bible. If this is true, what we just read, he says, you don't need to be water baptized. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't promoting contradiction to what they were doing there, but he drew a conclusion by reading words on a page in a book. You know, so the guy invites me out to breakfast, and I go out with him, and I brought a Bible, and he didn't. And uh, he said, you know, the stuff you're doing is seminary stuff. We don't do that. I said, what do you mean we don't do it? What do we do? He says, well, we're like a hospital. He says, we're here to help people with their troubles in life. We're here to be a place of comfort and warmth and love and encouragement on their way to hell. I mean, that's, guys, that's what's going on. I mean, they were, I asked the pastor over at Central Christian Church, I said, you know, when you do that water baptism thing, <laughs> you know, you say, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit for the remission of sins and the receiving of the Holy Spirit. I said, do you believe they receive remission of sins and the Holy Spirit when you put them in the water? Now, this is a Bible-studied guy, he, older than me. He looked at me for a minute and he said, no. So why do you say it? He said, well, that's what's written in the Christian church handbook. I just gave Jason a book. Uh, it's the apostasy of the Christian church. And uh, in the back of it, because he's been teaching about baptism in Acts 9, in the back of it there's a section in there that goes through the baptismal rites of like 15 different denominations. And they steal a verse from here and a verse from there and a verse from there. Nothing ties together. Nothing's consistent, but it's used to make it a religious ceremony. That's the way we do it. This little girl who's going through whatever this baptism ceremony this morning is at whatever church it is that they're doing it at, they're going to say something. They're going to make something about it. And all of them put something spiritual in the water. So if you're a... Believing in God is nice. You can't help it because it's built into you. I mean, I have a verse that says that. So if the verse is right, well, then everybody believes in God. Believing God has to do with having something from him. And we carry it around. And, and you know, if you believe this, if you believe this book to be true, Death doesn't mean anything to you. Nothing. 
really doesn't. You're, if, if you believe this, I, we were up at the conference and I wrote this in my Bible because a guy made this comment. He said, the, the work of the ministry that we're involved in is putting the eternal word of God into the eternal souls of men. God formed man of the dust of the ground. He formed man. That was what he called man. He said he formed man. Then he breathed the breath of life into and man became a living soul. The dirt was the man. The living soul is what God supernaturally put in him, and it's who you are. You know, he, Jason read, read this morning about uh, eight souls were saved on the ark. He didn't say eight people, okay? We know each other by our flesh. That's our experience. You see me walking down the street, you can say, hi, Frank, you know? That's just my body, you know? I mean... Come on, it's like a car. I mean, you get a facelift, right? <laughs> you know, I can get it redone. I could probably get my skin tinted. You know, I mean, there's things we can do. I mean, medicine comes out with it. Russ was up here preaching one Sunday morning, and he said medicine is now saying that they can add 20 years to your life. And I started laughing and interrupted him while he was preaching. I said, if you can give me 20 more at 30, I'll take it. But I don't want 20 more at the end of decrepit. I mean, what good is that? Who wants to live 20 years longer in agony? If you believe this book, the fact that you're in the body is just where you reside at the moment. Walking out of this room, you can't see me. I still am. I used to do it my kids at night when I tuck them in. They'd ask about heaven. You know, I got a verse that says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. When I hear that this corruptible will put on incorruptible, this mortal will put on immortal. I know that I have something else. When Paul talks about being caught up in the third heaven, he says, whether in the body or out, I cannot tell. Well, that's kind of a real interesting verse, isn't it? Whether in the body or out. He says, I was there, but I don't know if I was in the body or I was not in the body, which means I'm separate from the body. You know that. You've been to funerals. You see a body, you know the guy's not there. If you believe this book, you should not be intimidated by death. My sister sends out these emails, you know, pray for a cure for cancer. I'm like, why? You're going to die anyway? I mean, I understand. We want to make our life as comfortable as we can. Look, we like good stuff. I like cushy chairs. I like my motorcycle. There's things we enjoy in the experience of this life. But you know what? If you want a cure for something, how about a cure for death? Okay? There it is. There is a cure for death. That's the message. Because everybody's facing it and everybody's afraid of it. They believe in God, but they don't believe God because they don't know where he is. And we make this statement that we know where he is. He's in this book. But you've got to have a perfect book. God gave us a book. He gave us a book to equip us as adults to do all that he has for us to do. The book is not... For us to grow in our standing. That's what religion does, isn't it? Think about it. I mean, who gives more? Who, who volunteers more? You know, who's involved in more activity and service? I mean, we're all about to do. We all want credit. Come on, from when you grow up, you want credit. You know, I hit a home run. Did you see me? I was wonderful, you know? Did you see what I just... Look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. That's what we're about. But it's not about you. And it'll never be about you, but but we're always looking for credit for something. The book is not for us to grow in our understanding. The book is about, uh, I, I'm sorry, I, said, I, I might have said that wrong. It's not for us to grow in our standing, but it is for us to grow in our understanding. Go to Colossians chapter 2. Let's do verses instead of me preaching so much. And, and I want you to look at this and understand something about God and how he does what he does. Now, I'm relying on words that are on a page in a book. And we may have time to look at some verses because I want you to see what God thinks about his book and, and how this book even came about that you hold. See, there's two doctrines that are involved in, in, in if you have a book. It's called Inspiration and Preservation. I took you to 2 Timothy 3.16. I didn't even preach it. We're going to go back there in a minute. In Colossians 2 and verse 9, it says, For in him, this is the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, let, go back to verse 8. We'll start there. 
And this also addresses the whole religious world. Verse 8 says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. You know, when he refers to the rudiments of the world in Hebrews chapter 6, when Jason was talking about carnal ordinances in, in, in baptism that was commanded to the nation of Israel and why it was and what they did, those are rudiments of the world. Those are traditions of men. Verse 9 says, For in him, the Lord Jesus Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. You're complete. Um, I, I remember when we were talking um, with the kids, talking about when they trust Christ and they, be, they, you know, for we all by one spirit are baptized into one body. You know, the gospel that you trusted after you heard it and you believed it, you were sealed to the day of your redemption. Uh, there's a lot of religious groups out there that will have you take a first step to get in and then they have to add to it. Okay? In the charismatic movement, it was always the receiving of the Holy Spirit as evidenced by speaking in other tongues. I chased that one. I had a guy told me to go lay down in my living room. Phil Driscoll, I love this guy's music. He plays a trumpet. Guy told me, lay down in the living room, lights out, put Phil Driscoll's I exalt thee on it, and just pray and it'll happen. Do you think I wanted to know God? No, I'm serious. I did this. I laid down, turned the lights on. I'm sitting there listening to I exalt thee, and I'm like, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. He says you're complete in Him. When you get in Christ, you get everything He has for you to have instantly. And the way I explain it to the kids, I said when a baby's born, you don't go back a week later to get the ears. That's going to freak you out if you have to do that. <laughs> you don't go back. There's not new things to come. It's complete. And you're complete. And the understanding that you want to have is that this book is complete. It's finished. And, and the significance of Paul is huge in that. And I go back to 2 Timothy because I'll go ahead and tell you what I was going to share with you there. In 2 Timothy 3.16, we have this memory verse that everyone loves. And it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Um, the word Scripture, I guess, you know, if you kind of go back to how words are formed, it, it was graphe. It means the writings. Okay, scripture means writings. Okay, scripture isn't something that's, you know, somebody passes on through generation to generation by telling stories. It's writings. And we'll go into some verses that will show you how God was very, very specific in saying, write it down. Write it down for a reason. I want you to write it down to keep it. I want you to write it to preserve it and hand it on from generation to generation to generation. Writings. This says right here in this verse that the writings are given by inspiration of God. And in studying the understanding of the word and the meaning of inspiration, this is not inspiration like somebody was moved and inspired to do something. Um, my son sings. And in seeing other people sing, he started to envision that he could achieve some success. He was inspired. He was moved to perform and move in a certain way. That's not what the, the word means. This says the writings were inspired, given by inspiration, given by God. God breathed them out. These are God's words. God took the authors and he told them what he wanted to write down and had them write it down using their personality, their characteristics, but they're God's words. And I'll show you verses that will tell you it's the words. It's not the thoughts. When you take the Bible publishers, which started in the late 1800s and the early 1900s where they started producing Bibles left and right, and creating conflicting authorities, with all that conflict, there's only one thing you could get, is if I still have the Bible, it's not the words, it's just the word of God, and it's the meanings. Not the words, not the comma, not the jot and tittle, it's the concepts. That's where Christianity is today. The apostasy of the Christian church is the same apostrophe, apostasy of the nation of Israel, is they just didn't believe God. God. They made it up. And that's what the issue is. Christianity today doesn't believe the Bible is the inspired, infallible, perfect, inerrant book. In fact, back in the 1800s, their doctrinal statements would believe in inspiration and preservation. 
Now they say in inspiration. They don't believe in preservation anymore because they have now joined the rest of the army that says, well, if I tell you and you tell him and you tell her and you tell her and go around the room, whatever Harriet gets in the back is going to be so different than what I gave her. And that's what man says. It can't be reliable. That's what they say. And they have good reason to do it because if you go down to the store, there's a hundred different variations and different flavors. You know, I mean, the, the way the critics work is basically what they do is uh, they change it, they add to it, they subtract from it, and they water it down to make it what they say easier to understand. And they rip God's word right out of it. If you're going to believe God, you have to have something from God. That's from God, not man's best effort at getting it to you. Man's best effort isn't good. If there's none righteous, no, not one. If the righteousness of man is a filthy rag, if we're all sinners, then there isn't anything we can produce that's going to be God level. Either God did or it didn't. And if it didn't, then you know what? Quit doing this. If it did, then you've got to believe the book and you've got to find out. When I said examining the revelation of what God has given to us, that's what we do here. We get in it to see what it says. We don't get in it to say, well, you see what that says? Well, let me tell you what it means. You see what that says? Well, I don't know what it means. Let's look at another verse. Oh, when you look at that verse and that verse, I'm starting to understand what it means. When you get the understanding that God had a mystery that he kept in his mind before the foundation of the world and revealed to this guy Saul of Tarsus, the enemy of the believing remnant over here, when you find out that there's a revelation of a mystery that was hid back here and you start reading verses to understand why it was a mystery, I mean, do you realize where we are today. We have the finished work. We have the completed Bible. God's revelation of himself to us finished with all the footnotes and all the mysteries and all the secrets to give us a completed picture of what God wants for us to know as his creation. What in effect God has done is he's taken us into his inner circle. He's taken us into the eternal life conference that went on back here as God, in his foreknowledge of what was going to go on, planned the redemption of man, the redemption of the earth, the redemption of the heavens. He put it all together. And now he's revealed it, and now we're privileged to it. We have such a tremendous standing in who we are today. But now back at 316, all scriptures given by inspiration of God, profitable for doctrine. What is scripture? What's that? The writings, the writings that came from God profitable for doctrine. The writings that came from God are profitable for reproof, profitable for correction, profitable for instruction in righteousness. And what's that next word? That. Here's the reason God gave the Scripture. It's right there. We look at the first part of that verse and we say all Scripture. This is Those writings that came from God, they're inspired by God, profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. The reason God gave us the revelation of himself is for you, the creation, to know your creator. For you, the creation, to understand what you're a part of. See, if we're going to believe that book, you know what else you have to believe? There's an adversary. The devil's real. It's in the book. If the devil's not real, the rest of the book's not real either. If you're going to buy, buy. If you're going to chip away and pick, then go form a denomination or religion of your own because that's what man does. The truth is there's an adversary. Lucifer is a created being. Lucifer took a third of the heavenly host. God created the lake of fire for the devil and his angels. It stopped the spread in heaven. That's what it says in the book. I'm not telling you what it means. You can read the verses, and that's what we do. We examine God's revelation of himself and of what he's doing with man and what his intention is and what you're a part of. When the Apostle Paul got stoned, and I guess the, the understanding is that he, he, may, he may have been killed. I mean, I don't know. I've heard it said that way. And then he got up and he went back into town and started preaching. You know, we talk about people who would die. You know, they suffered so much. And, and, and we try to give comfort with each other by saying, well, you know, you know, if, if you could invite him back today, he wouldn't come. Well, now think about Paul, caught up into the third heaven. In the body or out? I'm not sure. What does he say in Philippians 1? He says, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. But far greater is my desire to depart, but i got to stay here. Why? Because you need to know this. If you could leave right now, 
get caught up into the third heaven, to be absent from the body and present with the Lord, how eager would you be to get back here and say, quit playing, guys, this is real. Kill me again, it doesn't matter, it's a body, I don't need it. I'm a living soul inside it. If you got it, that's how little your existence physically in this body would mean. Take care of it, it's the right thing to do. I love the verse, bodily exercise profiteth little. You know, I mean, and I know that because that's all I ever got out of it was little. <laughs> but, you know, the body's getting older, you know. I fell down in cheddars a week ago. Alan's going to laugh at me. I mean, I went back to get my wife's purse and whoosh, I went flying. Landed over here, landed here, banged my head. I got up and I said, oh, I'm getting old. The body doesn't do what it used to do. If you're going to believe God, you've got to have something from God. And it's so critical to understand that. Let's go back to the book of Ephesians, or go to the book of Ephesians. I only got about two hours more in verses, and it needs to be done. Because I'm actually not getting to the verses. I mean, we just looked at Colossians 2, 9, and 10. It said, you're complete in him. Look at Ephesians 1, 3. Ephesians 1, 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Do you guys pray for blessings? I mean, we got to use that term. I mean, when you became a Christian, didn't blessings kind of become a word? I mean, I got a friend of mine who sells Mary Kay, and if you call her up, she says, Have a blessed day. Blessings to you. You know, I mean, oh, what a blessing that was. Now, you know what? There's nothing wrong with the word, okay? I mean, if I'm understanding that, whew, I'm really glad that happened instead of that. But if I'm understanding it that God gave down a cookie to me because I was a good guy today, I'm totally confused and I'm looking for signs and I'm not understanding who I am in Christ. Good stuff happens to bad people. Bad stuff happens to good people. That's the way it is. We live in a sin-cursed world and every one of you, your body is rotten. It's fading. Do all you want to. You know, we were kidding about, you know, women like to go in there and, and you know, put on your face. My mother used to say, I got to put on my face. I'm like, I thought you had one when you went in there, you know. But, I mean, she got to put it on and she's making herself beautiful. And, and, you know, I said, you look beautiful without it. But that's a bad thing to say. Uh, you, you got to learn to compliment. But here it says, all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. All. Not some, not a couple, not one. You could get some more. Uh, go down to verse 8 wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. That means he's made something available to us. All wisdom and prudence. You have the mind of Christ. You're a joint heir with Christ. Everything there is to get, you got. All you have from this point forward is the ability to lose some of it in your standing at the judgment seat of Christ. It's what you do. Remember, Paul, we'll go to 1 Corinthians in a minute. I'll show you that. That doesn't mean you lose your salvation. You can't lose your salvation. Eternal life wouldn't be eternal, would it? It'd be temporary. It'd be conditional. Not eternal. Everlasting. All wisdom and in, in prudence. God has given us a complete book. And go to, uh, let's see, follow Ephesians 1 down to verse 17. Verse 17 says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in what? in the knowledge of Him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope. Not that you may wonder or guess. This revelation He gave to you is that you may know Him. That ye may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of His power to usward, who what? Believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. He didn't just give us forgiveness. He didn't just give us redemption, acceptance, purpose, and a meaningful life. What he gave us is he gave us the ability to be intelligized about all that he's doing. When he revealed this to Saul, and now you get it, and you see who you are in Christ, where you live, his prayer here was that your eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, that you would intelligently get it. He, like I said before, here's my notes I caught up on myself. He's literally taken us into his inner, his inner circle. He's revealed his ultimate purpose, his genius. 
That's what God has done. See, let's do a couple of verses on, on verses. On what the Bible says about itself. Matthew 22. I'm going to just run verses for a minute because it will come back. Matthew 22, because I'm not going to get them in if I don't do it. We're going to do this quick. Uh, let's see, Matthew 22, verse 29. Here's what the Bible says about itself. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. And I said I'm going to take that through verse 32. For in the resurrection, because this is what he's talking about, this is the Pharisees and they're dealing with it. So for in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But it's touching the resurrection of the dead. Have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, what he says about, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. He says, have you not read that which was spoken? Back at 2 Timothy chapter 3, all scripture, the writings or given by inspiration, God-breathed, selected words, Jesus Christ on the planet says, Have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying... So something that's readable is a consequence of God speaking. That's what that says. Exodus chapter 4. Here we go. We're going to run. In Exodus chapter 4, and I'm looking verse 14. Exodus 4, I'm in Genesis, guys, that wouldn't work, would it? Exodus 4, verse 14. Now I'm with you. Okay. Uh, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak, because you know what Moses was saying. I can't do it. And he says, The Levite thy brother, I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee, and when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. And thou shalt speak unto him, and put words in his mouth. And I will be with thy mouth, and with, with his mouth, and will teach you what ye shall do. God is saying, I'm going to put the words. I'm going to be in your mouth, and I'm going to give Aaron what to put in his mouth. God interactively involved in putting the words in his mouth. Go down to verse 28. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded him. He calls those words that he gave Moses to Aaron the words of the Lord. And verse 30, and Aaron spake what? all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. God is involved. We just read, have you not read that which was spoken by God? You can read it. God spoke it and he spoke it through his people. Go to Exodus 19. Exodus 19 and I have verse, uh, in my notes I got verse 25. Uh, and that's not really where I want to go, I don't think. Yeah, go ahead. Um, and then, okay, yeah. Uh, 25 says, So Moses went down unto the people and spake unto them. He came down off the mount. Uh, in verse, uh, chapter 20, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. He said, uh, he gave them God's word. God spake these words. You're reading them. They were written down. Go to Numbers 11. Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, or Leviticus, Numbers, two books. Uh, what I'm giving you here is verses that are verses indicative of the inspiration of specific words that are written on a page in a book for you, a revelation from God. He puts the words in his mouth for you, for it to be spoken, for it to be written down. Numbers 11, 24. Uh, says, and Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. 
and gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people and set them round about the tackle, he, tabernacle. Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. I'm going to skip that one. Uh, looking at time. I mean, you want a reference you can write down uh, if you're making notes, Numbers 2238, but I'm not going to go there. Uh, well, go, go, go to Numbers 2238. I guess this is Bala Balaam, uh, where he speaks to Balak. And uh, there's more information behind this, but in 2238, Balaam said unto Balak, Lo, I am coming to thee. Have I now any power at all to say anything? The word that God put it, putteth in my mouth, that shall I speak. Um, what happened was, he, here was a guy who wanted to curse and couldn't. And, and what happened is he says, I can't even speak anything, but God puts it in my mouth that I have to speak it. When God used human authors and human instruments... He did what he wanted to accomplish. He didn't motivate them to come up with something. They spoke what it was that he put in them to speak. 2 Samuel 23. Here's a lot of these. Okay, 2 Samuel 23. Um, and I'm looking at 1 and 2. These are the last words of David. And I want to look at verses 1 and 2. Uh, now these be the last words of David. David the son of Jesse said, and the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel said, the spirit of the Lord spake by me and his word was in my tongue. This book is telling you that God is interactively involved in the words. Go to Mark 12. Mark chapter 12, the Lord Jesus Christ confirms the inspiration of the scriptures. Mark 12, 35. And Jesus answered and said while he taught in the temple, how, how say the scribes that Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Ghost, the Lord said to my Lord, sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. You've heard that verse used um, in Acts chapter 7 is a good one. Uh, to compare. But here he is is saying, David, by the Holy Ghost. The psalmist spoke by the Holy Ghost. Look at Acts 1.16. Acts 1.16. These are verses that are showing you in Scripture, the book that you carry, what the book says about itself and how it came into being. All scripture given by the inspiration of God, all the writings God was involved in, have you not read that which was spoken? God spoke through human authors. Acts 1 and verse 16, uh, Men and brethren, this scripture must need have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost, by the mouth of David, spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them. The Holy Ghost, by the mouth of David, spake. Go to Acts 28. God the Holy Ghost. There's some really cool verses coming here. Paul's attitude uh, towards Scripture here in Acts 28, verse 25. Uh, and when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that, Paul had spoken one word, well spake the Holy Ghost by he saith the prophet unto our fathers. So the Holy Ghost spoke to the prophet Isaiah. David spoke by the Holy Ghost. Moses, God put his word in his mouth, and these things were all done by God through human authors. And here, let, go back to Acts chapter 3. You'll want this verse. In Acts chapter 3, and I'm looking at verse 18. This is a good verse. 
uh, I'm going to skip some here so we can get the rest of these in. But uh, in Acts chapter 3, verse 18, uh, But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Look at verse 21. Whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. I'm going to read some things to you rather than make you chase them. In Luke 170, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. Okay, you know how we talk about this revelation of the mystery, and Peter in Acts 3 is at Pentecost, and he's talking about that which was written by the prophets since the world began. You have a revelation to Saul of Tarsus, Paul, about a mystery that was hid in the mind of God from before the world began which we now have. Uh, Jeremiah I have in here. Let me see. I want to get to one. Uh, I got, you know, if you want to make a, a reference, uh, uh, Jeremiah 1, 4 through 9, Jeremiah 5, 14, Jeremiah 6, 19. What I want is, is to give you where he says to write it down. Because God, the whole thing in the book of Jeremiah, it's really neat how God puts words in Jeremiah's mouth. Jeremiah dictates to Baruch. Baruch writes it down in a book. Scripture calls these the words of the Lord. Here it is, Jeremiah 36. Let's just go there. we got a couple more. Jeremiah 36, uh, and it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, th that this word came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take thee a roll of a book, and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel, and against Judah, and against all the nations from the day I spake unto thee, from the days of Josiah, even unto this day. Then Jeremiah called Baruch, the son of Neriah, and Baruch wrote from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord, which he had spoken unto him upon a roll of a book. God's design of communicating to you, he had prophets, Moses spoke the message, God put the words in Moses to put in Aaron to speak, God spoke through the prophets, Jesus Christ says, have you not read that which was spoken? Well, if you could read it, it had to be written down. Here's an illustration where God says to Je Jeremiah, these are my words and I want you to write them down and I want you to write them in a book. And I want to get you to another one. Uh, I mean, I got Ezekiel. I want to give you... Revelation 1. Let's just jump over. Revelation chapter 1 and the book of the Revelation, John, and verse 10. Is that where I got? Verse 110 was in the Spirit. Um, I was in the Spirit uh, on the Lord's day. This is future. And heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, etc., etc., etc. It's a revelation from God. John seeing a vision, and God tells him, write it down in a book. Revelation 22. And then I'm going to come back to where we were because i got a lot more verses we're not going to get to and I know you all want to leave. Um, 22 verse 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, that's what textual critics do. They add. If any man shall add unto 
unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. God intends for what he writes down to be preserved. He has a method of preservation. It's through copies. We can study that. What I wanted you to get right now to get where we we're going is to understand in order for you to believe God you have to have something from God God orchestrated a method by which you would have something from him when we gather here we don't Bible study okay when we look at these words and we have this fellowship time Bible study is not simply studying a book to prove that you're right and the other guy is wrong now you guys who are understanding right division that are, that are starting to rely on the words on the page in the book more than you ever have are feeling better equipped than ever before and you can see error very easily. You turn on a preacher and you'll listen to him whether it be the radio or the TV. You go with somebody to visit some other place and he'll be going along and you're going, oh, that's good, oh, that's good. And then he'll go somewhere and you go, what was that? Where'd he go? He jumped off of truth and he just started to preach philosophy vain deceit, the rudiments of this world, the traditions of men. It is not studying to get you one in life. You don't do Bible study because you want to find out how to get the health and wealth that's promoted so much. Bible study, study is not what most people want it to be. It is looking into the revelation God has given to us. It's looking into his revelation of himself, his thinking, and his mind. He's revealed unto us his secret mystery, the mystery of his will. Back in Ephesians we looked at. God has revealed everything he has for us to know. There's no need for him to speak any further. It's all in his word. Whatever you think you need from God, you already have according to this book. We don't want to do anything here but examine God's revelation to us to grow in our understanding of who it says we are in Christ if we've trusted Christ for what he's given to us. That's why we gather. We're not looking to be smarter than anybody else. We're looking to be equipped. Paul says that we're soldiers of Christ. He says we're ambassadors in a foreign land. Jason was preaching this morning about who's running the planet, the prince of the power of the air. Guys, we don't belong here. We're in a body, but if you're saved, if you've trusted Christ and he's placed you in Christ, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away. All things have become new. We don't look at each other on the outward man. We knew Jesus after the flesh, but henceforth we know him no more. We know him as the risen king of glory. You need to know who you are, and we gather here to celebrate who we are to rejoice in who we are and what God has done, but to get equipped to understand what His will for us is. Isaiah 30, going to do three more verses, or four. Isaiah chapter 30. Believing in God or believing God? The word of God or the words of God that are contained in the word of God? Isaiah chapter 30, verse 8. Here is God talking to Isaiah, and he says, Now go, write it before them in a table, <clears throat> and note it in a book, that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. God's intention on his revelation to man is that it be forever and ever. Go to 1 Corinthians 2. Write it in a book. That's his method. I mean, God gets to do what God wants to do. I could say, why Paul or wow Paul. I could say, why write it on a book or just say, wow, he did. First Corinthians chapter 2. Oh, and I like this. This is good. <clears throat> Actually, I used to use this when we would try to imagine what heaven might be like when I was teaching young kids years ago over at Central Christian Church. But as it is written, I hath not seen, verse 9, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath pre prepared for them that love him. I used to go and say, imagine it. 
as good as you can make it. It's better. That's what I would do. What would you want it to be? It's better. Eye has not seen, ear heard, or mind conceived, but read the next verse. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. God has revealed to us his purpose. God has revealed to us his methodology. You can believe God because you have the words of God preserved in the word of God. Not the concept, the words. Um, it's interesting when you look at the King James Bible, it's a stagnant language. It doesn't change. The English language does. Um, when I was a kid growing up, the word gay meant something totally different than it means today. The word fat meant something totally different than it does today. Cool had more to do with temperature than anything else. The English language is modified and used all over the place. The, the old English that was used in the translation is a stagnant language that doesn't have new meanings coming out of its words. In fact, if you study the King James Bible, you'll find out that the meanings of words in the English language, a lot of them were formulated out of the usage in your King James Bible when the translation was done in 1611. So it's pretty exciting to see it, and, and the value of ye and thee, the value of a comma, uh, the issues that you can discover in studying this book are things that will help ground you in an understanding of why. There's no place in Scripture you're going to find a notation or a reference from Paul or Peter or Isaiah that says, look, at, if a language shows up that doesn't exist today called English, get that Bible. You're not going to find that. It's a faith issue built on doctrine. And God in His book has said why He did His book he said how he did his book, and it's his perfect revelation of who we are in Christ. And every one of you in here, if you're saved, you are trusting the words on the page in the book. But you've got to believe all of what God has said if you're going to believe any. You can't pick and choose. That's denominationalism. And we don't want to be religious. We want to be servants of the living God. We want to be participants in what his program and plan is for us and how he wants to use us in accomplishing his purpose. The magnificence of who we are. God had a secret. He revealed it. You're in it. He's going to accomplish what he's going to accomplish. I have a chiropractor I'm talking to recently, and I shared some things with him. He's freaking out. He had no clue. It's a friend of Alan's, and I said to him, uh, you know, well, um, you believe in the rapture of the church, don't you? And he says, well, isn't that the thing where some people believe it's going to be before and some people believe it's going to be in the middle and some people believe in... I said, what saith the Scripture? You can study and you can know. But, uh, you know, here's a good one. Abraham believed in God. That's what the verse says. Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. He believed God. And you need to believe God, but you can't believe God if you don't have a communication from Him. Let's close with uh, 1 Thessalonians 2.13. 1 Thessalonians 2.13, the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus. Um, God's chosen vessel to accomplish what it was that he had to accomplish in revealing a mystery hid in his mind. He says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. God's words have been preserved in the word of God. Uh, there's a verse I didn't read out of Psalms that talks about that the word of God, uh, the words of God are pure words. Um, we're privy to something bigger than anything you'll ever find on the planet. We're privy to the mind of God revealed to us who choose to participate and be involved with Him. And it's a magnificent thing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to You for all that You have done. We're so thankful that we have a book that we can trust. We're so thankful that we have an authority that's other than man. We're so thankful that you have designed and laid out your own plan and your own methodology of how you would accomplish